And welcome to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. We are local talk radio streaming live on our Facebook page and also on our main page, KFAR660.com, under the announcements section. That's where you'll find the link today. We might move it around tomorrow just to keep you guessing and on your toes. Joining us in the studio today, we've got Josh Bennett from Bighorn Enterprises. Good morning, Josh. Good morning. Try that again. Good morning. There we go. Now we got you. back. And from the (laughs) Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty, we've got uh, Dave Giesel. Good morning, Dave. Good morning. All right, gentlemen, what's on your mind? Actually, uh, Dave is now our uh, in-house man from the Mises Institute. I've dubbed you. (laughs) Okay. uh, Since they won't come on the radio. Does that come with like a knighthood or anything else? I thought about it, but I didn't bring a sword. Oh. All right. So we're going to call him. for those paychecks to start rolling in. <laughs> David Von Mises. <laughs> David Von Giesel. Yeah. And for somebody who doesn't know what the Mises Institute is. It's a uh, institute for um, economic education, basically, online. They, they call it the Austrian school. What makes it that? Um, it's, it's a school of economic thought that originated in Austria a couple hundred years ago. And they're carrying on, well, actually a little over a hundred years ago. And they're carrying on that tradition. Basically, if, and, and I know I'll, I'll, we'll get into the show here in a second, but I think it's, it's important that we define our terms and people understand where we're coming from. Uh, it, it flies in the face of Keynesian economics. Yeah, it's uh, it used to be the mainstream school, or it, it was birthed out of the mainstream school a couple hundred years ago, the classical school. And then when um, when this weird pseudo-economics of, of Keynesianism and neoclassicalism kind of emerged, um, the mainstream liked it so much, the politicians and everybody, that they decided, well, we'll just teach this in all of our government schools and and kind of sweep the whole classical economics under the rug. And so the uh, the Austrian school s- sought to preserve that, and that's what the Mises Institute does today. All right, thank you very much. I just it's important because sometimes you know, like I heard you and I heard Natalie and I've heard other people talk about the Austrian school, and I had to do a little research in the background to kind of figure yeah, out for myself. The, and not that I talking about. not that I want to discourage people from. I mean, people mm-hmm. need to to do their own research and find things out. But I do want to at least give them a leg up so that they know where we're coming from. Mm-hmm. All right. So what's on our our collective mind today? <laughs> well, I don't know what's on our collective mind, but uh, on our individual minds. Um, <laughs> We wanted to talk about uh, energy prices, or I wanted to. I actually wanted to talk about that last week, but we got kind of sidetracked in the second half hour. A um, couple weeks ago, I guess during the week, people were telling me that there was a lot of talk about energy prices and, uh, you know, fuel's so expensive in Alaska, and we need the government to do something to make our energy prices cheaper. And um, somebody asked me, you know, what do you think about that? And I actually thought that the whole discussion was kind of silly because energy prices relative to other prices really aren't any different now than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago but or costs, 30 years ago. It costs more, David. Right. The, the numbers are bigger. Um, you know, $4 a gallon is different than $1 a gallon. That's true. But um, it's not like the oil companies or whoever, you know, or the gas stations are in this, you know, but, weird price gouging battle. But um, if you're making minimum if wage, it doesn't go very far toward a gallon of gas. Right, right. And that's that's the whole deal is the wages have not kept up with the prices. And people notice that in gas just because it's a it's a price that everybody pays. And so it's it's commonly known, right? How much does a pound of sharp cheddar cost at Fred Meyer, Steve? Do you know that off the top of your head? Um, I want to say close to eight bucks. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, that sounds about right. But But not everybody buys that good. And so they don't talk about the price of a pound of cheese. Now, if you were to look at the price of a pound of cheese versus the price of a gallon of gas over the last 10 years or 20 years, you would notice that they really haven't changed very much relative to each other. Less than a factor of two. Uh, close to the same close to the same price. Gas has gone up in the last 15 years about four times and uh, about the same for the price of cheese. Of course, the cheese industry and the oil industry are not in some weird collusive agreement where they're going to both raise their prices by the same amount to gouge people so when they try to go buy cheese instead of gas, they can't afford it. No, what we're looking at is general price inflation, right? All prices are going up because the value of the thing that prices are denominated in is going down. And the reason that people complain about energy prices going up is because they're, what you said earlier, their paycheck doesn't go as far. This is part of the, the fruits of inflation. And so what, if, what if we just raise the minimum wage again? 
<laughs> yeah, that, well, then you'll create unemployment because then marginal jobs, jobs that are worth an employer paying someone whatever, six bucks an hour, seven bucks an hour, if they have to pay someone 10 bucks an hour for that job, they simply won't hire someone for that job. Or they'll have to lay someone off to hire someone else because they're marginally profitable and they would lose that that margin of profitability if the minimum wage went up. So what people are really noticing, what people are really noticing is general price inflation and their wages not inflating at the same rate. And it's really funny to me to hear those same people complain that the government should do something to lower energy prices because the only thing the government can do to change the price of something is to either print more money and dump that money into that sector or tax you and dump that money into that sector. So there's nothing they can do to, to lower the actual, the real price of anything. So what do we do? What? Just suck it up? Well, what we do is we we notice where the problem is coming from. What is the price of energy in relation to the to gold that's uh stayed that's actually gotten cheaper yeah the price of energy relative to the price of gold has gotten cheaper um the price of energy relative to the price of platinum has gotten cheaper the price of energy relative to the price of silver has gotten cheaper over the last 10 years things are not going up our dollar is going down is basically right and so and that that has to be recognized if you don't start there then you start prescribing all these solutions that attack symptoms. Which is Keynesian economics. Which is basically Keynesianism. And part of part of uh, the whole deal is there's this there's this money neutrality argument that's out there, and this is kind of nuanced and technical. But basically, uh, there's a group of of economic thought that says, well, money is neutral. So if if the government doubles the supply of money, yes, prices will double, but your wages will double too, right? And so the money itself is neutral. Well, does your savings double? Does your savings that's already in the bank, does that double when there's inflation? I don't think so. No. Does your wage rise as fast as the prices do? Uh, my wage actually got cut this year. Right. And and but some people, some people We didn't lay anybody in, off. Some people who live in specific areas of Virginia and Maryland, their wages didn't get cut. So, um Eventually, over the over a very long period of time, wages will eventually reflect the inflation, but prices inflect in, reflect it first. And this is called um, Cantillon effects. There was an economist, Richard Cantillon, uh, like 300 years ago, who noticed that when when there was debasement of currencies in feudal kingdoms, that you would see the uh, the poorest people, the lowest people in the in the uh, kind of status of that society, would receive the cheapened money, the the excess money that had been created last. So the poorest people benefited the least. So so here's basically how how Cantillon effects work. Um, the government creates new money, right? That money by law goes into the primary dealers, the big banks on Wall Street, first. They are the first recipients of it by law. And so they receive new money while all of the prices reflect the old supply of money in the economy. And so prices haven't gone up, and these banks have new money. So they can buy more stuff uh, with their new money because prices haven't gone up. And then as they buy that stuff, the money trickles down into the places where they bought the stuff from, you know, the store owners, and then into the next rung of the economy, et cetera, et cetera. And so eventually that new money is distributed throughout the economy. But as it's distributed, the prices begin to rise, right? Because people notice that there's there's more money and there's the same amount of stuff. And so the first recipients get full purchasing power with the new money. And then the last recipients get uh, significantly less purchasing power with, with the new money. Prices have already risen. And so that's what people are noticing with fuel prices. They're noticing that their wages haven't gone up yet, but the price of gas at the pump, the price of their heating fuel, the price of a pound of cheese at Fred Meyer has gone up. And so and so they ask the government to intervene. And so the government does. It injects new money. It injects new money, and it goes straight into the banks on Wall Street, which it has to by law, and the same cycle just gets exacerbated. Prices go up before these people's wages go up. The price of gas goes up, their paycheck doesn't go up for another year or two. So... Um, so energy prices, the, the crux of this is energy prices have not gone up relative to other stuff. 
your currency is being destroyed. And the more intervention you ask for in order to help energy prices or whatever, the more your currency will be destroyed. Before we get to the phones, and incidentally, all four lines are on hold, I want to ask a really quick question. I think I already know the answer. To this. this has actually been happening since the dawn of time, hasn't it? I mean, governments has all, have always debased their currencies. It's just that you used to be able to tell because the coins would get smaller. Right. Well, or they'd get less shiny. Because they'd, they'd rub off a little bit. They'd uh, reduce the silver, or the copper, or the gold content. In in Rome, um, what the drachma uh, started off as a as a almost pure silver coin, and by the time Rome collapsed or declined, we could say it was pure copper. But there was a long, there was like a 150 year period where it went from basically pure silver to basically pure pure copper, and it was always just a little bit at a time. Well, we'll bring the coins back, and we'll just melt a little more copper in. We'll just melt a little more copper in. We'll just melt a little more copper in, and eventually there was no silver left. Well, in the last hundred years, our dollar since 1913 is worth today's dollar is worth two cents yeah. of a 1913 dollar. Right. Wow. So we're getting there. We're getting there. <laughs> and 98 percent of the way, <laughs> and a lot faster than they did in Rome. Yeah. Four well, five eight talk is the number. You guys ready to go to the phones? Yeah. Good morning, caller. Who's Who's this? All right. Looks like we had uh, somebody call up and uh, Sweet. jam the phones for us. That's awesome. All right. If you'd like to try again, the number is 458-TALK. You can also uh, send us an email. Email address is, Dave? Uh, PatriotsLament at gmail.com. All right. And, uh, you know, th- this issue of the money debasing, I think most people understand it because they see it happen. Uh, well, in theory, y- you'd hope. But the fact that there was a whole week-long discussion about energy prices shows that they are not seeing it. The discussion should have been, my money buys less, not, I can't buy as much fuel with my paycheck. Well, and you keep on hearing people saying, well, maybe we should just set the price of fuel lower. Right, which is just a fundamental misunderstanding of supply and demand. That's Prices reflect supply and demand, right? And so when prices go up, it's, it's because either the supply of the good has gone down, right, mm-hmm. or the demand for it has gone up, if you have a stable currency. But if the supply of the currency goes up, then the prices are going to go up, too, to reflect equilibrium. And that's what's happening. Let's go to the phones. Good morning, caller. Yeah, good morning. Frank Turner here. Hi, Frank. What's up? Well, I got a breaking news uh, message for all of you. Uh, I just received in the Tenth Amendment Center. I sent it out to the Ron Paul and Josh, and I sent you one this morning. Uh, first in the nation, the Virginia House considering a bill to refuse the compliance with the 2011-2012 National Defense Authorization Act to nullify and benefit detention provisions. Uh, also, I received a call from, uh, I sent this to uh, uh, John Cargill and Tammy Wilson. I did receive a call last night from Tammy Wilson. She sent the Virginia bill, uh, the first in the nation, to nullify the definition to the legal department, Alaska's legal department. So uh, uh, let's give her some support and get behind her to get this bill going in the state legislature. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Now, uh, th- th- let's talk. Can we talk for a second about the nullification issue? Because I, I know a lot of folks really put a lot of stock in the fact that the Tenth Amendment, the Constitution, basically gives the states the rights uh, to, or guarantees the state the right to overrule the, the federal government. But we've seen every single one of the amendments called into question in the last, uh, well, certainly in the last couple of years, uh, from the Second Amendment, the right to keep and bear arms, look at how many restrictions there are on how many, on what kind of guns you can carry, to even what you can say in public, the First Amendment. If you don't have the right permit, you can't gather in uh, a public park. Uh, I mean, at what point does the Tenth Amendment really mean anything? Uh, it means something as long as your <coughs> local legislators will stand up for it. I mean, all of our rights are the same way. You but, only have the rights that you stand up for. So they can pass the law or whatever, and the feds are going to say, no, nah, baloney, we can do whatever we want. So then it's up to the state to say yay or nay. Are they going to go along with it, or are they going to say, no, we're doing this? But every single time that we even think about or talk about not going along with it, they ta- they threaten to take away our federal teat, and all of our local legislators from the state on down to the borough, on down to the city, roll over on their back like a puppy and wet themselves. That's when you start to <laughs> got to get... That's some. my favorite part. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's uh, the best part for the show, anyway. <laughs> yeah, we need a TV show for that part. Um, I have been told that when you have like a resolution, uh, a nullification type resolution, or even a, a nullification type bill, that whether or not... It's meaningful and enforced is almost exclusively the domain of the governor. 
It's almost exclusively the governor who decides how high up he's going to hold that resolution and how it's going to be enforced by the state troopers, by um, police agencies, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, it would be great if, you know, Tammy and, and these guys uh, pass this thing. Um, but then it's a matter of holding the governor's feet to the fire. So, well, well, we all have seen Governor Parnell's track record. I mean, he's a strong proponent of talking about and standing up to the governor. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, he jumps on the bandwagon just a year or two later after he sees what they do to the other states. I, I have, I, I mean, I, I don't want to rain on anybody's parade if they are particularly politically savvy to uh, Governor <clears throat> Parnell, but... I have to say, I haven't seen him develop a pair yet. Well, that's we could say the same thing of all the other governors exactly. we've had in the state. And, and there have been there have been uh, resolutions and things like this passed before. I remember a few years ago we got the resolution against the national ID card passed, um, and there were a couple other kind of uh, cute little resolutions that got passed like that. Um, they had a resolution, the, a resolution against the Patriot Act too. I think. I think several years ago too. Yeah, I think there might have been one. Which and, I mean, that that did a whole lot, didn't it? <laughs> right. So it depends. So it's great. Like we go through the dog and pony show and pass the resolution or the bill or whatever, and then it's up to someone to enforce that. And um, so that falls onto the the governor's lap. Whoever the governor may be, you know, Parnell or whoever, you know, Sarah Palin, whatever. Uh, but if they don't decide to hold that up and to enforce it and to instruct uh, their, you know, the the state, what, attorney general and these people to actually hold up the state law over the federal law, it's not going to happen, no matter what law is on the books. Ain't going to happen. 458 Talk is a number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. All right, looks like we've lost them all again. Uh, I do want to recall, uh, remind people that when you call in, you will be placed on hold. And if you hang up, what that does is that uh, jams the phones. Oh, wait. You already know that, don't you? That's okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, y- we know who it is. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? <laughs> Four, five, eight, dog. Good morning. <laughs> Who's this? Oh, we. hey, who is this? Carl. Carl, what's up? <laughs> Oh, I, I'm looking for my earphones, but I, let me tell you, I would argue against that mean economics or whatever that Austrian, whatever the... I mean, look at our local government. Don't you think we set the standards by by having, like, high wages for our government employees and it's a trickle-down effect? You know, the the government borrows more money and pays their workers more, and the money is supposed to magically trickle down to its poor people. Um, well, yeah, that's what Cantillon effects are. That's what we uh, we talked about. That it's from the bong. Thank you very much, Carl. Four five eight talk is the number. And we've uh, no, we're having some fun today with people calling in and hanging up. That's all right. I, <laughs> You know, it, it, it's interesting to me because I I was just reading an essay this weekend about uh, the three classes that are at war right now. And a lot of folks, you know, they talk about the middle class, the upper class, the lower class, lower class, lower class, old hat. What we really have is we have the economic class, the people who actually make money. We have the government class, the people who are basically just leeching on. And, I mean, because how much wealth does the government actually create? Anyone? Zero. Anyone? Uh, the only wealth that a government gets is the money that it takes from the people that it is governing. Yeah. Now it's the rise of a third class, the Praetorian class is what they call it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Did you read that? Read oh, that man, it's, yeah. it's phenomenal. That's I mean, awesome. basically, it borrows the language from the Romans because we saw it happen in Rome, but we've also seen it happen in Nazi Germany, and we've seen it happen in the Soviet Union, and now we're seeing it happen here in the United States of America, in which basically... It's a whole subset of law enforcement, an entire class of people which are being employed to enforce the laws. The people who are employed as military, the people who are employed as uh, sheriff's deputies, the people that are employed as police officers, you name it. Anything at all that has to do with law enforcement, that basically they are servants to the government, but they're also servants to the economic class in the sense that it is their interest that they're sent around the world to go out and, and enforce. And anytime you see the rise of the Praetorian class in history, 
it spells the end of that society because it's only a matter of time before it collapses. And it was a fascinating article. So yeah, well, no, even uh, you know, even if you work on the premise that you need uh, you need police or whatever, uh, which some of us do, some of us don't work on that premise. Um, what you're talking about are federal Praetorians, hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So if you have you know local law enforcement like Fairbanks police are paid through uh, the city, right? The city government, the mayor. Um, and so they, they have a limited pool from which they can steal from to get their paychecks. Uh, but when you're talking about, you know, federal enforcement through Department of Homeland Security, these threat fusion centers, uh, whatever. Look at, look at how the TSA has grown. Right. And, and yeah, not, not by the fault of the TSA employees, no. per se, but the, the bureaucracy, right? Yeah, you end up with this federal Praetorian class. And since it's so big... Um, the costs are abstracted, right? If you want to look at how much the, the Fairbanks Police Department costs, you can look at the city budget. It's pretty easy to see. If you want to look at how much the Department of Homeland Security or the TSA costs the average taxpayer in Fairbanks, good luck. There's so many layers of bureaucracy. There's no, there's no way to understand that for the average individual. And and the same thing in Rome. You know, you're t- talking about the uh, legionnaires and and whatnot who were you know, federal enforcers. They weren't enforcing in the city. They were going out and, you know, trying to grow the empire. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? This is Josh. Josh, go ahead. I would like you guys to talk about um, how inflation affects Social Security and pensions because a lot of people think they can hide them, have their money away in their wealth and just kind of protect it from all this, but I don't think they know what's going on. Sure. Yeah, that's, well, a, that's a really good question. Um, we talked a little bit about how uh, inflation affects savings, right? If you put 100 bucks in the bank and uh, the money supply doubles, uh, that becomes worth 50 bucks. And, and the bank doesn't magically double your savings just because the money supply doubled. And so for Social Security and pensions and things like that, you're saving a fixed amount of money in the past. And then as, it, as inflation happens, say there's 5% inflation, or the, the official number was 3% last year, and you made a 2% return in your uh, pension, right, then you actually made negative 1%. You can buy 1% less goods with the money that you set aside to save. And so you get uh, negative real interest rates are a possibility in that scenario. Uh, and if you're on a fixed income like Social Security and you have inflation where prices are rising and you have a fixed income where your your income from the government is not rising, um, obviously you're going to lose lose purchasing power. So your standard of living is going to fall, even though the checks are the same size. Four, five, and thank you for the call. It was very good. 458 Talk is a number. We are uh, coming up on the Fox News here in about 30 seconds. Good morning. Who's this? Uh, this is Lisa. Good morning, Lisa. Um, well, you know, I'm, uh, I'd am i never jam a line because when I bother to call, I want to talk, and you guys always cut me off or interrupt. So um, do you want to hold me over through the... Uh, yeah, we can do that. Sure, you betcha. 458 Talk is the number if you'd like to call and get in queue. We are coming up on the Fox News right now. And we'll be back with more Patriots Lament after this. Welcome back to Patriots Lament right here on KFAR. Uh, I'm Steve Floyd, the man behind the microphone, and joining me in the studio, of course, uh, for the Fairbanks Campaign for Liberty and representing locally the Mises Institute, Dave Giesel. Also, we've got from Bigger and Enterprises, uh, Josh Bennett, and on the phone, one of our regular callers, Lisa. Good morning, Lisa. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, you know, the state gets the uh, money for royalty oil from... Uh resources that belong to the people in our uniquely socialist constitution with regard to the oil resources. So, But they take their pricing cues from world market prices, and that's been fine for a long time, but uh, when you have a situation where, you know, like uh, in 08 when Morgan Stanley and Chase were holding tankers offshore and, and buying up depots of fuel and, and hedge funds were trying to manipulate the price, and it zoomed up really high beyond what demand was. And when you have, uh, you know, um, Medinejad, um with nuclear um, potentiality pretty soon saying that they want to wipe a country off the map and, um, you know, and then 
people who don't want nuclear fallout happening around the world say, well, no, we don't want that to happen, so we're uh, going to sanction you uh, if you get a nuclear bomb. And then uh, they retaliate by saying, we're going to close the Straits of Hormuz, where 40% of the oil goes uh, out uh, for the world. And then, the, of course, that would upset demand, and the price could zoom up um, you know, through the roof. We could be paying $16 a gallon like Europe. And so um, we're sitting here in Fairbanks, Alaska. It's supposed to be 50 below tonight. And um, uh, the state is already, you know, giving a, a cost power equalization help to for electric to the bush and, and sweetheart deals to Anchorage. And, uh, you know, there's a, a portion of the state that um, relies on on um, oil, where, whereas, you know, they could have had a gas line 40 years ago, but didn't uh, bother to make the right plans. Lisa, I need you to get to the point here. we got uh, all, the, all the lines on hold. What, what did you want to say? Uh, well, in other words, um, that's a manipulated price, and the state is holding the money from the royalty oil, and the state could cut back, uh, you know, uh, because we don't have a right to the mineral resource right under our own property, and if, if it bubbled out of the ground, we couldn't even use it legally. Because <clears throat> because it's socialistic, the, their hold on us over the resources for that, because of the Constitution, as you like to recite day in and day out, uh, they need to make it affordable for the settlement, not the desettlement of the land. And um, you, you hear all the people calling up to say that they're leaving because they can't afford to be here, although they want to be Lisa, here. Lisa, just, just point of order, I want to point out that the Constitution does not say affordable. The Constitution says available. No, it says use and benefit. So I'm saying that is my point that uh, because they have not provided gas to this area uh, because of their decisions, um, and we remain mostly largely on... All right, Lisa, just point of order. I'm going to read to you word for word, Article 8, Natural Resources, Section 1, Statement of Policy. Quote, It is the policy of the state to encourage the settlement of its land and the development of its resources by making them available for maximum use consistent with the public interest. Where is the word benefit there? Okay, do Where you is the word affordable there? Public interest and settlement. If people are leaving because of the high cost, that is not consistent with public um, use and benefit. So what would you suggest? That we just give everybody a free fuel voucher? No. Uh, like I've been talking about since 08, before Pascavan called it the Pascavan plan. The same exact thing. that I emailed all the legislature and uh, talked about incessantly is that there's only a small amount of distributors in the state, and all you have to do is have them get their rebate back from... Uh, how, how about this? How about we increase the number of distributors, we increase the number of refineries, we get rid of the government uh, subsidized monopoly on the distribution of the natural resource and have a little competition? What would happen then, Lisa? Well, we could do it a number of ways, but the most expedient way is the way that I suggest. And you, once again, being a utopian, pie in the sky, not attached to reality and having a cognitive disconnect. Uh, would you call yourself a real politique? No, not at all. A Newtonian there? Well, I mean, not. Are you a Newt Gingrich fan, Lisa? No, oh, no, you know what? I've had a number of people ask me, and so I keep saying, uh, I, 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 seriously, <laughs> like uh, upwards of 10 people have asked me, who are you going to vote for in the Republican well, primary? Uh, that's uh, of course I would have you have you not noticed that I'm an evangelical just like the founders and framers which of course you guys are not your utopian anarchists and I'm not going to say that anarchists are not wait 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 Lisa call me another name and no that's not be, I'm, I'm okay with that no 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 I'm, I like I'm, that I'm, name well, I'm, I'm, no that's you, that's fine you're, you're okay I, with the utopian I appreciate the compliment okay Lisa yeah that's right you call yourselves anarchists no. that you're darn right. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not shirking away from the anarchist label, but I'm tired of you simply being able to, or, or thinking that it's okay for you to label people. Get label to the point. Yourself. Who are you going to vote for? You label yourself. Who are you going to vote for? <laughs> Ten, nine, eight. You're not going to answer. Uh, I would okay. like to answer, but but I would like to. Bye my bye. Answer. Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to Patriot's Lament. All right. All right. Yeah, you know, more suppliers, that's an interesting conversation. There's not that many people in this state. This this is larger than the country of Germany, and there's less than a million people here. So how many suppliers and refineries and blah, blah, blah can this population support? Not that many. That's a good point. Uh, part, of, part of choosing to live in Alaska, where everything has to be shipped in, and where there aren't very many people, 
is you're going to be subject to high shipping costs, right? High transport costs on all goods. Plus, there's there's lower demand, and so you're going to have poorer economies of scale up here than you will in somewhere else where people want to live because it's not 50 below out. It, it sounds like you are arguing against the cost equalization program, Dave. Uh. Anybody yeah, well, there is a, there already is a cost equalization did, program. It's called it, market market clearing prices, which I will agree we don't necessarily have because of the oil cartel. But here in the state of Alaska, there is actually a cost equalization program in which we, all of us, the state of Alaska, subsidizes the fuel costs and the electricity costs for people who live up on the North Slope oh, sure. or who live out in the bush right. because it is so much more expensive for them and it's just not fair. Well, how much does our how much more does our energy cost because of the government in the first place? And how how much can you tack on? Okay, let's just say that they don't have any regulations, they don't have any taxes, nothing. They're just a private company. They go out, drill a hole, suck some oil out. How much does that actually cost them? What could they what could they afford to give it to us for? If all that would yeah, be, what would be the real what would be the real 20, market price? Twenty five thirty percent is our tax, right? It would be well in the in Alaska, right? Um, it's actually it's higher than that once you talk about all the overhead because the way it's implemented. Um, that I I know someone in the in the uh, legislator and and they were talking to a guy from Repsol, I guess, who was looking at operating in in the state, and he said when they went to their tax team to look at the jurisdiction, to look at Alaska as a jurisdiction, their tax team said, like a bunch of them said they were going to resign, basically, if they had to deal with Alaska's tax code, um, because it was the worst tax code they have, they had ever seen. And this is a Spanish company that operates in Europe, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there's that. But, but it's a global, oil is a global market, right? And so there are worse jurisdictions and better ones. Um, and so, you know, you tend to have... Uh, People will drill more where there's less taxes. So the prices are distorted by government, definitely, to some extent. But Probably at least, 50%. At least there's uh, there's competition between them somewhat. Yeah, it's In inter- the state of Alaska, though, I would say, I bet it's 50% of the cost. Um, yeah, it has to do it, with the state. I would say so. Yeah. What, do, what do you make of the, the latest news that just came out that uh, despite the argument from the oil companies that uh, they need the tax break because they can't, because employment is going down, that the, actually we are at the highest level of employment in the uh, oil industry in the last 20 years. Yeah, well, you can you can squeeze them, you know, as hard as you want. They'll just eventually go elsewhere. I mean, the, the only reason that they would complain about... They, they have no incentive to be here other than to make money, which is a terrific reason to be here. And if they can't make money, they'll leave. And so the fact that they haven't left, you know, yet says, well, maybe, you know, maybe they could be squeezed harder. Um, but there's another factor to that, which is it, it costs them to set up here and it costs them to move. And so if they anticipate that um, Alaskans enjoy those jobs and like the wealth that's brought here by that industry, maybe they're anticipating that the uh, the taxes will be made more reasonable. But if they're made worse and they can make more money elsewhere, they'll just pack it up and go to North Dakota. I don't like know a lot how, of much people we, up here. how much do we enjoy their work and their money that they pump in here? Because we sue them constantly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, We're constantly suing them. There's a big, uh, the whole Point Thompson project, that's still in litigation right now. And that is where... Most of the gas is going to come from. But, if they, they, ever but they had a contract to develop it. They haven't been developing it. 30 years they've been sitting on it. At what point, it Josh, it cost, you're a It's button. not cost-effective for them to do it. Otherwise, if they can make money to do it, I guarantee Then why don't they, they give up the lease? It. I mean, that's the whole you're point. Also, if, if you, yeah. ha- if you are, you're a business because owner. Because they know that eventually it's going to be okay, worth it. Okay, if you had a, a, a storefront like we do here downstairs at the, at the radio station mm. that's sitting there empty. If you had a storefront and you and you leased it to someone and said, look, part of the agreement is that you develop this and make it into a, a, a business and bring in more business, and they just sat on it and they didn't develop it, at what point would you say, um, you need to give me the, the building back? So this is, yeah, this is part of the weird land rights that are part of our Constitution. Yeah. If, if you had ownership and a competitive bidding process for the land where oil is, you would have a very different... Um, a different use of it. So we were we were reading uh, Rothbard's Man, Economy, and State for our book group last night, and one of the things he brought up is that you, if you have land with an exploitable resource, there is no incentive to not develop that land once you're the owner, because once you if you if you own it right, and you're not getting wealth from it, then it's just sitting there right. You're not you're not deriving any utility from it. Um, 
there's n- there's never any economic incentive to sit on it because you're giving up its present value. If you own it. And if you don't extract that value and turn it into a, a monetary value, you can't invest that, right? And so the asset, the wealth doesn't grow. It just sits there in the ground. But if you're leasing it from somebody else, you can keep someone else. You can keep someone else off of it. You can keep someone else off of it. That's certainly true. Um, and so that's a different scenario. If you were the owner... Right, and there was someone else who wanted to develop it more than you did. They would outbid you for it. They would they would approach you with a, a amount of money you couldn't refuse. And Bring what it. if what if they did anyways? What if they did? What if they had gas sitting there right now? They had it all, and actually they do have a couple wells drilled. I know that for a fact. What are they going to do with it? They could. I mean, I've, they I've, could do what? I've, what could, I've, they, I've they heard that they could Point ship Thompson. that they, they could ship the gas through the existing pipeline. Oh, and I've heard that they could also truck it down here, really cheap. <laughs> They, they could use a Russian tanker through the ice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Oh. Hey, what's on your mind? Well. Wait, Carl, didn't I'll, you already call in once today? Uh, this is Did like you put down the crack really pipe? Guys. You, you know. Are you there? Are you, did you, I want to know. Are you high? Yeah. Uh, well, what we should do is build an infrastructure to hold. Um, an excess amount of oil and gas, and we can even turn coal into um, liquefied, you know, what's, Carl, oil. Carl, what's the point? What's the point? I mean, we could also press unicorns and, and extract butterfly. You know, if we had unicorns, turds. we wouldn't need cars. You know what? That's a really good point. 458 Talk is the number. Good morning, caller. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Um, all right. we well, the on, on the whole thing, you know, while we can make oil out of coal and all this stuff or coal gasification and stuff like that, um, yeah, you, you can you can do all that stuff. I mean, there's the oil sands, the tar sands. You can get oil from that. It's not profitable below, the point, below $85 a barrel. And it only becomes marginally profitable above that. Yeah, people and so, so the higher price... The higher price of oil, again, th- we're talking about these prices all relative to mm-hmm. dollars. So mm-hmm. dollars are losing value. That's the, the main thing. But as the prices go up, more sources become profitable. And so the price goes up, and these new fields that require new techniques to go after, or, or oil sands, people start extracting oil. And then everybody looks around and goes, oh, there's oil everywhere. There is oil everywhere at a certain market price. And it's not ten bucks a barrel. Yeah, it, it's like more like eighty or ninety or a thousand bucks a barrel. Right. But when we, we're, we get to a hundred bucks a barrel, I've got so many see. synapses firing at once, okay. Dave. I, I want to ask two really quick things because a, a lot of people point to the success that the Nazis had in coal gasification to run their vehicles as if somehow that that's <laughs> going to be a proven technology. Uh, but but people forget that one of the main reasons why they got, the Nazis were going that way is because we, I mean we, the Allies had denied them access to the to the oil, and so they were basically they were they were forced to find whatever they could, no matter the cost, to get it done. Do you suppose that being in North Africa was a strategic decision, or a, was that an area that was really high on on Hitler's? Geographic list, or was well, that more? Well, of a, they needed a more, more room for the white people, right? <laughs> uh, Resources. Uh, the, right. The, other, so, the other thing is, you talked about the value of oil, uh, of the dollar relative to oil. There was news that just came out this week. India has just announced that they will no longer use the dollar for trading oil. Um, it had been rumored that they were going to. The official announcement came this week. They are now going to use gold only to buy oil. What does that mean? From we're from Iran. From Iran. Yeah. Right. What's that mean? That means we're going to war. <laughs> well, it means <laughs> yeah, maybe, uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, it it definitely is a is a change in the dynamic. I mean, if you want to talk about what gives the dollar value today, it's the fact that it's the de facto currency for all oil transactions. And to the extent that goes away, it loses a very significant portion. China has already announced that they're planning on doing it. India now officially, they are going to be trading gold for oil from Iran. And, by the way, it just came out yesterday that there is a floating forward base moving into the Middle East from the United United States. I did see that. I saw that one. I did see that. So we are now positioning our troops ready to go in and pounce. Well, I think, I don't know. I think there's a lot of posture. Russia and uh, Iran are going to trade rubles and rowels or whatever they're called. And yeah. Russia has told us that if we tried to interfere against Iran, that we're, that we're not only going to be fighting Iran, but we're going to be fighting Russia. There's there's a lot of posturing. Um, I'll definitely say that. Beating, I, I don't know where beating it's going to Beating of the proverbial chest. Ooh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I am more man than you. You know, <laughs> I was just thinking about Lisa's call, though. I, I think that there is something that the state can do that won't be socialistic in nature to reduce the price of uh, energy. And it's not much. 
But they could get rid of the gas tax. But you know, every time they talk about doing that, then then you always hear people saying, "Well, how are we going to build? For, uh, how are we going to pay for our road improvements?" That's the money we use for our road improvements. We could kick John. the haul road back to Alieska. Yeah, they for one. I would be glad if they did that. <laughs> Four five eight talk is a number. Good morning. Who's this? Yeah, this is Red here. Red, what's on your mind? Uh, you were right when you heard an assumption that natural gas can be brought down the pipeline with the pipeline as it goes. It even helps it flow better. But the powers that be in in uh, Juneau and uh, legislators and a couple of our senators in uh, Washington. They're keeping it tied up. That's their little ace in the hole. That's their little game, you know, making a buck here and there because uh, it's done all the time in the lower 48. What do you think about the pipeline coming out of Canada if they ever go, go to the Keystone? They're, they're going to pull that natural gas off in Canada or they're going to pull it off in the United States either way and make that coal tar flow. And I'll let it go with that with your guess. All right, thanks, Red. So yeah, I mean, even... Uh, even not talking about sending the gas through the same pipe, the right-of-way that the pipeline is built on was originally built to accommodate a gas line, which Lisa mentioned correctly. Um, and that was 40 years ago. That's why I don't think they'll ever make a, a separate gas line, is it was supposed to happen like two years after the oil pipe was finished, and it didn't. How, how many projects that were shelved 40 years ago are going to happen in, in the United States? Wait, wait. There are a whole bunch of roads that were supposed to have been built here in Alaska. Yeah, that have never been built. I mean, but, it's yeah. it's it's the same premise: is that once if if we are dependent on government to do it, then we're also going to be licking the hand that feeds us. But even on the on the gas thing, right? Um, my my energy bill for my house is not my largest bill. My energy bill is well well under a thousand dollars a year for heat. Okay, my electric bill is significantly higher than that. And That's, then there's there's another because I built my house that way. So even if even if natural gas were free. I would save a maximum of like $800 a year. And I, if natural gas came here, there's something that people in the Matsu Valley are familiar with, which is that it's very expensive to make a natural gas network for distribution. Yeah, exactly. And so not all the houses have it. And what, so that's, that's what something to remember. What is your most expensive so, household item? Dave? My single most expensive uh, annual recurring cost on my house is the penance that I pay to the borough. Dun, dun, dun. It's, more than, it's more than double what my annual electric bill is, and it's it's uh, quadruple what my heating bill is. But you are paying for the privilege of all the services that you get here in the You're borough, Dave. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, that, that's I mean, bottom line, yeah, no. So right, and 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 he's right. You know, uh, you know, most people couldn't hear what he said because he wasn't on a microphone. So. Yeah. Uh, would you like I'm to repeat microphone. yourself? What do we what do we pay the borough for, Aaron? <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out myself. <laughs> oh, you know, look at all the vital services that we have here that the borough provides: trash collection, you know, li- I, libraries. I missed earlier when you guys were talking about the governor and all that. I got here right after that. I just been sitting here kind of quiet, but um, you know, the governor in Alaska is kind of unique because it has its own um, armed reserve, which is called the Territorial Guard. Which is kind of Alaska Defense. Uh, what's it called now? It's not. It's no longer the Territorial Guard. It, they've got a new name. The Alaska State Alaska Defense State Force. Alaska State Defense Force. But um, recently, in the last month or so, they um, disarmed them. They're no longer allowed to be armed at all. No, we heard that that's not true. Uh, they come no. in my store every day. They're not armed. They've been told they're not going to be. They also changed their uniform to take it farther away from the regular army, and they're going back to um, BDUs. Yeah, 1980s yep. stuff. They, they, they really stand out. All right, 458 Talk is the number. Good morning. Welcome to Patriots Lament. All right, we've cleared the lines again. It's been kind of a fun morning today. <laughs> By the way, uh, just for perspective today, the current temperature and uh, the airport is reading minus 47. Downtown temperature minus 39. Out at Eielson, we've got 47 below. Out in North Pole, we've got 53 below. At uh, the... Let's see, Fort Yukon is 56 below. Cold spot in the interior right now is Husla, where it's minus 62. We've got Tanana at 60 below. So, you know, enjoy those really low energy prices. Well, I just want to know, I want to know what the state's going to do about the price of cheese. 
You know what? Actually, that's a really good point. Price I, cheese is quadrupled I since I used to go out and and purchase. I mean, one of my one of my favorite cheeses is called Huntsman. It's got a little layer of uh, like what looks like cheddar with a layer of what looks like blue cheese, but it's its own cheese. Uh, it used to be my favorite cheese, and just a little one ounce deal of the cheese it used to be like four bucks. Yeah. When I was buying it regularly, it's gone up to sixteen bucks for one ounce. Right. <laughs> so so yeah, is that is that a result of we need some price control. Is that a result of the state's policies? I, you, I, know? you know, I really think that the state needs to subsidize my cheese. <laughs> it's right in the state constitution. That's <laughs> <laughs> maximum benefit of cheese. But I mean it's the same that's the same thing. That's the point. Is is if you get wrapped around the axle about energy prices and the state causing them and what the state needs to do there's a there's a kernel of truth in that but the the biggest driver of energy prices is the loss of purchasing power of your dollar it, the state does subsidize your cheese as long as you're not uh, one of the peop- worker people out making money through WIC and food stamps yeah, yeah that's true uh yeah, but but not the good cheese you can only get the block the block cheese. You can't get the the nice fancy cheese that I like. Well, I like guess wick. the point is, is I know I've if tried. you want your uh, the state to subsidize your cheese, stop working. Oh, you can probably get the legislators to pass a pass a law. I mean, they're we need price they're controls there. on it. We need yeah. price That'll make it better. <laughs> Certainly won't cause shortages. <laughs> Look through history. Well, that, well, that's price another. Controls work every single time. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you joke. That is a right. sarcasm. So if you. Yeah, uh, I, we've got about five minutes left in the program today. I know it's been going by fast, but I, I need an action point for today. So while you guys are thinking about an action point, I'm going to check the phones again here and see if there's anybody actually there. Good morning, caller. Who's this? Yeah, good morning. This is Trill. Trill, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I think Josh was saying earlier that the dollar was only worth about two cents. If I remember right, about five, six years ago, I had a friend down uh, down near Delta that uh, was buying silver dollars from the Mint. They were costing him thirty dollars a for one dollar, thirty Federal Reserve notes for one dollar, for one silver dollar. So you know, figure that out. I think it's a whole lot less than two cents. All right, thanks. Oh yeah, thanks, actually, Trill. that was uh, the last time I looked at that was about a year and a half ago. Anyway, so it probably is probably minus two. <laughs> Four five eight talk is the number. Good morning. Welcome to Patriots Lament. Who's this? Why are you guys so afraid of truth and debate? <laughs> I, um, would you define debate for me, Lisa? That's where somebody is fully allowed to make their point, and then you guys put in your point, and then you allow a counterpoint, and then you can rebut that. And then since you have the microphone and uh, endlessly, uh, you should relax and al- allow information to get out. Does it depend on the other person actually taking a breath and allowing that person no, to no, say? No, that's none of your business. Okay, so basically... So I have to talk fast because you guys don't want the truth to get out. Oh, is that what it is? Yeah, absolutely. We don't want the truth to get out. I think I think what it is, Lisa, is we'd like you to be able to actually have a conversation instead of grandstanding every time you call in. But thanks. 458-TALK is the number. All right, we've cleared the lines again, gentlemen. We've got less than uh, now uh, just a couple minutes left in the program. What about buying silver? Because even, even if it costs me, what is it now, up to uh, 33 $34 today, today for one ounce of silver, uh, am I not better off by putting my dollars into something like silver which will still have some inherent value rather than putting it into a bank account or into the stock market where the value can be wiped out with a single stroke of the government the of of the president's electronic pen well yeah i mean certainly if you just have cash in your bank account or or um i mean financial stocks are sort of linked to that not entirely then uh inflation is going to eat you alive right and so if you save cash or or cash-like assets, um, and the supply of money goes up, the purchasing power of your money will go down. And so if you buy something like silver or even oil stocks, if you're worried about oil prices, what a great thing to buy, right? That will tend to uh, track the price of the commodity. I mean, if you own the commodity, it will track the price of the commodity. What about and things so like you won't lose purchasing power. Bullets or, or bulk food or things like that. Or those, I mean, it, it, in terms of actually saving for the future, isn't it, it? Would that be? Wouldn't that be better off even than oil stocks? Yeah, uh, if you plan on sticking around, food's kind of hard to take with you. If you have a basement full of food and you decide you want to move somewhere else because you get sick of fifty below, um, it's very cumbersome to move with. That's a good. Point. The, the, the the value density is low, and so that makes it hard to take with you. Action point. GE three is coming, by the way. Oh yeah, they, they, they another injection. And and they vo- just also voted to raise the debt limit again, which is very much like on a household saying, "Hey, honey, we've maxed out the credit cards. 
Oh, you better go get another credit card. Okay. What we need, what we need is another pres- president like Reagan who only raised the debt ceiling 18 times. Oh, that would be a great... I know idea. someone that voted against it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, action point. Don't got one. Vote for one poll. Well, if, <laughs> Thank you, you, if you think that your uh, savings and pensions and, and IRA and 401k are secure for the future and they're saved in dollars, like that caller mentioned... Um, you might want to study inflation and its effects on assets like that. And if you think that there is actually a social social security trust fund, you might want to think twice. Right. The biggest lie ever. Yeah. There's no. <laughs> there's, there's no lockbox. There's, there's no money. Right. No. There's <laughs> no money saved for social security. It's all paid out of current taxes. No. <laughs> yes, you are. And, and well, much of it's paid out of inflation too. And so those. I mean, before you even get the checks, the money is created and dumped into the into the economy, so-called. And so, from the moment that, from the moment that debt ceiling's raised, inflation starts affecting prices, and you don't get your check till at least a couple months what if, later. What if you stopped using currency and started bartering with people? You and you jail. get taken to jail. Yeah, uh, what, there was that case. Yeah, yeah, the food for uh, the meat for heat, which I think is a brilliant name. What was the other one <laughs> with the guy that was uh, minting? Yeah, uh, von Nothaus. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, th- there was a guy who, trade. yeah, there was a guy who made silver, silver and gold trade units, and he has been, he has been convicted as a domestic terrorist for doing so. Twenty years, I think. Yeah, that is that. Uh, Bernard von Nothaus. Isn't that how we got our first silver mint? You know, in the United States, it was the same thing. Somebody started minting silver for use in the colonies, and the king said no. Well, they're using, yeah, they're using Spanish dollars. All right, guys, we're out of time. Uh, real quick, website. PatriotsLament.blogspot.com is the website. Email. PatriotsLament at gmail.com. See you next week.